So today we're going to look at contributing to some of Big Slew's, um, and not some, one Big Slew R package and kind of it be a tutorial and a general workflow for how things can be contributing. I will say a big part of choosing this topic now was motivation for myself to create a lot of the tools that you're going to see today. And so that means that um, they're first time anyone else is seeing them. So if you see typos or you see errors, please let me know since no one else um, has looked at them. So oh, that's my Zoom. All of the things we're going to be doing are through GitHub. Um, this is not going to go into how to use Git or GitHub in general. Um, there is a to be to be made tutorial on how to do that. So I'm going to assume some Git and GitHub knowledge. Um, this is the big slew GitHub. And just uh, so everyone knows, in the tutorials, there is now a GitHub section where I forgot to push the changes where the tutorial that uh, follows what we're going to do today will be up here when I remember to push it uh, up to GitHub. It's not here right now, um, but it's OK because you're not going to exactly follow along in the tutorial. I do a different ish GitHub issue and a different change to a package because I had to test that it was going to work. And actually, the one we're going to do today is is new. So it will be up there soon though and i'll put the link uh, with the video as well where the video is posted so the first thing we're talking about is how do you know what a package needs or what the group needs or and this isn't just for big slew this is on anything on github um and so we're going to go to Kima because it is it's the one with the most issues and you'll see up here there's an issues tab with a, you know varying levels of difficulty of issues. And so these, since this is a public repo and in any public repo, anyone can post uh, to this. Anyone can make an issue saying, hey, I tried your code, I had an error, or hey, I would love this uh, feature. And so there are these tags that a lot of these are custom, every GitHub can make their own, but I have these colored tags called like enhancement, meaning there's nothing wrong with the code, uh, but there'd be something could be useful added, or there's probably the more important ones, bugs, like there's an error or there's a warning. So these, these will get addressed generally first because they're an actual um, issue. And so on any repo, you can make a new issue with this green button. And so I'm gonna kind of create a, a fake issue to start. And then we're gonna go back and actually work on this issue here. Um, we just create a new issue. And this is one of the motivations for doing this tutorial was to make these. We have kind of default templates for the two most common things, meaning there's a bug or you have a feature request. Um, I'm gonna do the bug one because it's a bit more thorough. Um, and these will change over time as we figure out like what's the most common needs. Uh, so if you see a bug in any of our packages or code, uh, you can go here and you know, have the description. What did you think was supposed to happen versus what actually happened? Um, this could be, this was my goal output and the output I got, you know, is missing a column or, you know, something like that. Ideally code to reproduce uh, the, the error, um, which you see if actually go to preview, this is a link to just a stack overflow page with how to make an R minimum reproducible example. Um, you can also just use the example data that's part of the package, which the tutorials in Big Slew have examples of how to use the example data, um, as well as you know what sort of software you're using. And this will really help me mostly <laughs> be able to then quickly address what sort of bug you found. Uh, more simply, a feature request is much shorter. It's just, what feature do you want? Um, what sort of solution do you think would work best? Have you tried, you know, this might be a, I tried to do something and it didn't work, let's add it. So there might've been already an alternative you considered that did or did not work. And then, you know, this one, be sure to then go label, the other one automatically labels. So we have all these labels here of, you know, this is, this is probably not a bug, but this is probably you're asking for an enhancement or maybe you're asking for additional documentation. Um, you can also add things like, this is like just straight up a question that you have, or this is something that you're working on, but you want help with, um, as well as I have this tag that I'll throw up. If you see things that have this and you're new to Git or new to our coding, these are great, like the easiest ones to tackle. Um, so they're good first issues to deal with. Um, the third option is if neither of these really work, then you can of course make a blank issue and put whatever you want. We just ask that you use the labels to help us figure them out. I can also add labels later. Um, and you know, you can assign it to a specific person if 
you've already been chatting with them. Um, but because the specific people are just <laughs> the three of us, uh, that probably it'll, it'll probably just be me. Um, so when you make an issue, so I'm not going to actually make one. Um, they show up here, and you know they this. I'll go to an old one to show you an example. This one is the one I did the tutorial on to show. We see it's in the closed, meaning that a bunch of successful things happened, created the issue using the template. Um, Baselin had a comment, which then I said, you know, thumbs up. I addressed the issue and did a pull request, which we'll go over how to do, and then it automatically closes. But we have this whole history of everything that happened. And if we wanted to come back to this and do additional changes related to the same warning message, then we could continue, reopen the issue and continue the conversation. So that's a big part of issues is that they're just a conversation and a place to store the, you know, the GitHub history of what's happening to something. The one different sort of issue we haven't seen is going to be what this one's like. So sometimes maybe you have a bunch of comments and you don't want to make an individual GitHub issue for each one. Um, you would start a blank issue and what you can do is make a checklist. Um, if I show you, if I were to edit this, the checklist syntax is just like this, or you can, you can have Git line automatically type it out for you by starting one with this. And then this way you can list a bunch of different things that are related to this repo altogether. And then when somebody's ready to address just one of them, it has a nice automatic conversion. So this is the one um, that we're going to address today. So I can just convert it to its own issue right off the bat. So you can make a nice list and then we can they can auto make their own um, issues. They won't follow the templates then necessarily, but at the very least then they're they're all in one place. So this is one we're going to work on. So I'm going to convert it to its own issue and then go to it. And we see there's no description provided. Um, I will go fill this out later, but at this point you should go look at the templates and kind of fill it out like it was the template um, to begin with. But the issue that this one was having was that um, inside of the summary table function in Kima, if no genes are significant, so what this does is it says that FDR levels of, you tell the FDR levels, but say 0.1 and 0.2, how many genes are significant for all of the variables in your model? And if nothing was significant for a variable, it just has been deleting the row, which I don't want it to do that. I want it to actually put zeros and show you, you modeled, say, um, viral infection and age, and age wasn't, a, you know, an impactful variable, you want to see zero, not, not have it in there and have you forget that you even put it um, in the model. So this created this issue and we'll, you know, it's see it's mentioned, it's, it's linked, it's all great, it's all linked to the original place it came from. And so I said, I'll fill this out later and have all the, the things, but this is where we'd open the conversation. Somebody might have additional thoughts on this or additional ideas. And this is a really simple one since I've already figured out how to do it. But you know, issues can live on for many months, many years um, and have them go back and forth until you figure out what, what you wanna do. Um, but here, we're not gonna fill out any of this because I'm just showing you um, how to make this into something. The one thing I am gonna do is label this. This is actually a bug, like it shouldn't be deleting these rows. So how do we go about making these changes? If we go back to the main GitHub repo. We see that this is a public repo um, and I'm the owner. <laughs> and we see that the this will either say master or main, depending on your version um, of Git. The newer ones are supposed to call it main. This one I actually need to change. That this is only editable if you have right privileges to the repo. And so since we don't want to just give the whole world right privileges to something for obvious reasons, what you're going to need to do is create your own copy and e be able to do the edits. Because I'm owner, I can, instead of making a full copy, I can make what's called a branch. So you see here when I was doing the tutorial, writing it up, I made a development branch. Um, and we see two branches listed here. We can see that here's the default one, the main one that everyone's using. And then we see that I had you know, some things yesterday, 21 hours ago, going on in the development branch. So if you're the owner of a repo or you have write privileges, the best thing to do is create a branch, 
name it something like dev for development or with your name if there's many people making branches or your initials or something uh, and then you can do all of your edits on there and merge that in so just quickly so if um, i'm not going to do the command line version because honestly i don't use that but there will be a future github <laughs> and git tutorial that talks about command line i use github desktop and so the way you make branches in here, you can make them on GitHub, but then you have to clone them to your computer and it's a whole thing. So it's just easier to make them in here. Um, I already made a Kima branch, so I'm gonna do it for a different repository just to show it. So I'm in the RNA et cetera repository, which is another R package. And we see we're on the main slash master branch and you simply go here, create a new branch. Um, dev, I already have one named dev, so I obviously can't make it again, but like it could be dev two. It could be whatever, just don't name it main or master because that will mess things up. Uh, then if I were to recreate it, it would automatically take me to the development branch. We see there's nothing going on in this package right now, so I can switch back and forth between these. Nothing is different between them, so it doesn't matter. But on something like Kima, you see here I'm on the development branch that I made earlier. And we see I've done some changes, so I preemptively did all the edits <laughs> to this to fix the issue, um, which actually took way more lines of code than I was anticipating. And so I can do everything on here, work on my computer, do add commit, um, push to GitHub a million different times if I want until I'm finally ready to say, okay, I've tested these changes, these changes are good, they're on my version. And so like I said, this is a branch for me. which you can create on GitHub here or inside of your Git desktop um, or your other GUI of choice. So like I said, you have to have write privileges. So for those who do not have write privileges uh, to pick SLU, what you will do instead is create a fork. And I'm gonna link it to my personal account. And what this does is it's exactly like a branch. It's a copy of the repository, only instead of being under Big SLU Kima and housed there, it's now under my account. So like if I go to my account and I go to my repositories, we'll see that I have a full copy of this. And so this is the not preferred way if you have write privileges because it's creating additional copies that GitHub needs to store. But if this is the only way you can do it, this is the only way to get a copy um, here. So then I could clone this to my computer and again, do all the same things, do add commit change, test, do, do whatever I need to. Um, instead of this saying it'd be a dev branch, it would be the master or main branch of Kima from K. Dill McFarland instead of Kippa from Big Slew. But in either way, the goal is to take the thing you wanna edit as is, create some sort of copy you can work on, do all your work, do all your changes, and then ask the original owner of the repo if they would incorporate your changes for you. Any questions on how to make a branch or a fork? Okay, pull up, the, lost the chat, there's the chat, ah, there we go. So in either case, you make a branch or you make a fork and you have it on your computer or on GitHub, um, but usually code changes are easier on your computer. Um, I, you know, I can show you in my finder where this is, come on. There we go. Uh, I just have, you know, big slew folder where all of our different things are. But you'll see that if you created a fork and you already had the original big slew, you would need two different folders because they are two different repos. But if you are the owner, like I am, I this is the big slew Kima, um, exactly like it is on GitHub, and I don't have multiple copies because there's a hidden file here that you don't see the dot git folder that's keeping track of the fact that I have two branches. So there's only one copy, which is really nice. Um, and we can switch between them here. Like you can see, this is the development branch. It doesn't really look like much has changed, but trust me, things have changed. Uh, inside of here, we can switch 
in between, but I would say don't, since I haven't committed these changes, I don't wanna switch between them yet because it will cause an issue. But so what I'm gonna do is I'm pretend I've been working for time, working for days, I'm going to commit these changes to this branch or in your case, maybe fork, and that's saving them just like a normal GitHub thing. Um, bad cat behavior going on behind me. So it's always putting a nice message that's helpful. So, uh, oh my gosh. Um, removing rows with zero significant genes. I would probably write more than that in the future. Again, making sure I'm on the dev branch, the correct one. I'm gonna push this to GitHub. Is why I like the GUI so much. And we're going to go back to the big slew repo, not this fork. I'm going to end up deleting this fork because I don't actually need it because I'm working on the branch. Go back in time there. Nope. So we see here that this has popped up. Uh, GitHub is being helpful in saying that you have another branch that uh, had recent changes, recent pushes. Um, and so it's saying that your branch has things that this public main master version does not. So it's asking like, hey, maybe you want to compare them and uh, pull these changes. Or what we could have done is, you know, we knew in our, um, here's the issue we want to work on. You see here, we can link a pull request. We haven't created one yet, but so you, know, you go back here, you do all your changes, you come back to this conversation and say, okay, how do I take all the changes that I just made on my dev and push them to the main version of Kima and keep this conversation going and keep these conversation links. And so the way to do that is to create a pull request. Because I'm on a branch, this automatically shows me this nice button. If you're at a fork, it doesn't necessarily do that. So you could also just go to pull requests and this is asking me to compare, but I'm just gonna say, create a new pull request, because like I said, a fork won't necessarily show you those nice buttons. Um, the default is for it to say master to master, main to main, it's not what I want. I wanna go from whatever I did on dev, I want to put into the main branch. If you were on forks, you click this, which allows you to see not just branches, but also forks. They don't automatically show them to you because there's a lot of public to GitHub repos that have been forked dozens of times and so it's too long of a list to look through if you don't need to but we see um gotta remember to always keep note the arrow is going the opposite direction of what you at least what i automatically think it should be so it's from the right one push the changes to the left one and we see it gives us the line by line just like in the github desktop gui all of the changes that were made if there were multiple commits done this would nicely list you know, all a summary of every single commit that was that was done. So like I said, you can work on your branch or your fork for a long time and have it save all those changes. So I'm gonna create this. Uh, there is a template again that it pops up for you uh, showing like kind of the bare minimum things that a pull request needs. Uh, what was the purpose of these changes? and then some tests that you need to run. Um, this is also an active <laughs> active area of development, figuring out what tests need to be run before we merge things, because um, generally I'm the only one editing the packages, so I just don't need to check things since I already know they work. Um, but just in general, if you're working on an R package, things to always look for, make sure you've commented all of your code uh, so that somebody else can understand it. And then for those who do package development, there's a development tool called Check which runs on the package and will give you errors um, or warnings when there's issues. And so running, making sure you've run that. And then because Kimma works integrally with a lot of other big slew packages, um, it's in running another check to say, if I change the Kimma output, like the main output that it makes, does that break any of the downstream packages that use the Kimma output as example data? Um, very often, I think, for those working you know, in Big Slu who aren't me, you're gonna be able to do the first two things and then ask me to do the third one since I'm more intimately involved with all the different packages and know which ones to check. But if you already do know that say RNA, et cetera, uses Kima, then going and doing the check um, for me is also super great. 
Uh, so these are the similar to when we made an issue with checkboxes. These are the checkboxes. We can pre-check them and say, yes, I already, so I already did all these things. So I can check them and you can check the preview to make sure uh, they're checked. Um, you can also I'm gonna show you if you don't check one, we can check it later and it's fine. So I'm gonna fill out um, the purpose. Actually, I'm not gonna, <laughs> don't need to watch me type. I will fill these out later correctly, having a nice purpose. Um, and we see it's automatically named the same as the last commit message, which in this case works. You might wanna change it if you've had a bunch of different commits and edits. And so we create it and we see the checkboxes. If you hadn't checked these at the time or needed to check them later, you see you can just click them, which is very nice. Um, and it keeps track of how many have been clicked um, over time, which is really nice. So before we scroll on, the first thing to do is link this back to the original issue. So that's the first one that pops up. And it's nice now if we go back to the issue, we see that now this is linked and this does two things. One is it just simply links them so you can click back and forth between them and see what happens really easily. And another great one is that when we resolve this, when we actually push the changes, so this is so far, it's just a request. It's saying, hey, owner of the repo, I have these changes, can you incorporate them? It's still the question. Uh, once it's resolved and answered, then this automatically closes, which is very nice because uh, I don't know about you, but I forget to close issues um, after I've addressed them quite frequently. Going back to the pull request, um, we see here because we used a list, it actually shows you that there were three tasks and all of them are clicked. So you can actually see a nice summary on the page if you haven't completed all of the tasks um, before you even click into it. And this, just like an issue, is a conversation. So um, ignore this for a second. Uh, other people can come and write comments, can ask additional questions. Um, if you're not the owner, the owner of the repo might come back and say like, hey, I tried to tried to merge, like if this wasn't green, if there was an error here, like I need you to address some issues. And our goal with Big Slew is that before any of these are merged in with the main branch, we want to have somebody review it. And so in either the commits, which just separates it by each commit, in this case, we only have one commit, so I could just see it all at once. This shows all the changes that have been done between the dev branch and the main. And this is another place to have a conversation um, so this just like an issue can start the conversation. So, and it doesn't have to be like as a review, right? It doesn't have to always be errors. It can be like positive things. Great, like addition of like this example was added specifically so that if there's missing rows, they show all zeros and it's fine. That's a good question. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, so let's say that you forked, um, and so the fork creates a copy of everything that's currently in the main, right? Yes. Okay, and let's say that you want to work on one of your scripts and make changes to it. So are you, so let's say I'm on my local computer and I'm running something. When I am calling the script, how do I know that I'm calling the script that's in the fork? registry or rather than the main registry. So the forks, because it's a completely separate repo. Um, so let's actually just go for it. it will. So if I do, if I clone it, it will be a completely separate uh, folder. So like if I search for Kima, we see that like this version of Kima mm -hmm. is separate from this version. And so mm -hmm. I just throw it on my desktop for, for ease. Oh, I'm sorry. I meant branch, not fork. I apologize. Oh, okay. It's going to be like completely it's separate branch. folder. So it's actually, an e it's much uh, easier. It's just telling me that, yes, it's, you're not owner. Um, so yes, if I'm on a branch, um, honestly, this is part of the reason I don't use the command line frequently because if I forget to change things on the command line mm -hmm. with a GUI like this, you know you're on the correct branch because it's shown here. So mm -hmm. before I save any changes, um, 
it's also kind of the danger of branches, I guess, since I'm owner of both, is before I would do any edits to these files, because there's only one copy of this, I would mm -hmm. open GitHub desktop, double check that I'm on the development branch, make all my changes, and the default is then for it to push those changes here. Mm -hmm. If I were accidentally on um, the master, the main, what would happen is it would, I would, it's actually funny, I did this earlier. <laughs> Um, what would happen is I, you know, say I did all my changes. So let's just do a change. It might be easier. Well, well I, I'm not sure that I asked the question properly. So let's mm -hmm. say that I want to run the script that I'm updating. So like say it's a Perl script or whatever. And so I say Perl script name dot PL, blah, 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 blah. How do I know that that Perl script is being called from the main uh, repo or from the branch of you know, a, a different branch. So yeah, it's the it's the checkout process, which is what this is doing um, by clicking. And so, like I said, it's you go here and make sure you're on the right one because let's let's open the actual file. Okay. And so hold on. So like, let's say I'm using the script. I just want to make sure I'm, I'm I'm getting this. So let's say I'm in a completely different directory where my data, like where I'm running the script from, where the script actually is. Uh mm huh. -hmm. So, but I'm calling it, if I'm in my Git repo, if I'm on the, the branch, um, like if I've currently set the, I guess it's the head or whatever it is, I don't remember. Yeah. Um, but I'm saying I'm in the branch, then anytime I call that script from anywhere else, it knows to take the script from the branch and not from the, uh, main? Yes. So in the hidden dot git folder is information on which branch is currently checked out. And so like, I think this actually will nicely show the, so I'm on, you know, I'm just, I'm looking at this script with, with the change um, or sorry, this script on my R, make this readable. And so this is an easy change to watch because I know there's only one example in the original. I'm in, oops, I'm in the master or main, and this is the version of the script that my computer sees. If I move to the development, we see it changes. Now this is the version of the script my computer sees, which has okay. the changes. So, whatever, so if I were to ever call, like if I'm testing it to see if my changes work or not, or if they mess something up, it's automatically calling the one that's in either the main branch, if that's where I'm currently working, or if I'm, if I'm in some other branch, if that's where I'm currently working. Yes, Get the Git folder automatically tells everything else on your computer to work with whatever the currently checked out version is. Thank, oh, it's like kind of like a library where you check it out. That's yeah. So okay, thank you. <laughs> yeah, so it's like, you know, this, this example, this is like a global setting. If I move to main, now the computer doesn't know those changes happened, but they're hidden inside of the Git folder. So somewhere it knows. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah, like I said that's, so in the command line that's doing checkouts. Um, like I said, this is one of those where like I'm a, I'm very much about command line because it's reproducible, but for these specific or specific Git things, I really like the GUI because I can just visually look and say like, okay, I'm on the right, I'm on the right thing. Good. Um, and actually interesting here, we see here that now this is uh, numbered. Um, it's saying that the, because it talks to GitHub, it's saying that this development branch is currently involved in a, the number 12. Uh, I forget if it's the issue or the pull request number, the pull request. So it's saying it's involved in number 12, which is funny. Cool. Uh, so just to recap, the, the idea of um, Elizabeth's question was that which versions do you know when you have branches? Like, so when you have forks, they're completely separate copies. You'd have to call with a different file path. So that's how you'd tell they're different. Um, and with a branch, just, just make sure that your GitHub uh, GUI or your command line is set to the correct branch that you want to be testing um, or working with. Once you've done all your changes and you've created this pull request, they said we're going to have a review process, very likely me, um, and the review might be 100% just positive comments, it might be no comments at all if there's no changes. Um, 
you know, things like, you know, this in the real world, because <laughs> I'm doing this quickly, I would come and say like, hey, you should probably, this is not the best commenting. There should probably be more comments, please add. That's a note for future me. Uh, but what will happen is still, whoever is reviewing it will finish the review. Um, I'm owner of this, so I can't approve my own changes or request changes of myself. But if I were doing this for somebody else's pull request, I could either just approve and say, great, this worked, let's merge everything, no problems. Um, or I could send it back and say, hey, actually problems, let's review back and forth. Because I'm the owner, I can only just provide comments to myself, which look a lot the, a lot the same as request changes. But it takes us back to here's our pull request, our original one. Here's our link to our issue. And now it's showing me a summary of the review that happened. Um, and we see that this is just a positive. Um, you know, you can nope, have react. People can, you know, again, conversation, emojis have reactions. Uh, but I know that this is all good. So like, oh, that's a comment. So that's great. So I'm just going to resolve the conversation and say like, hey, that was just a nice comment. I read it. It's nothing else I need to do. Um, if it was something a request, the, the person making the changes could go back to their branch or their fork, make those changes, re-push them to GitHub, and then update the conversation saying, hey, check out the latest version. I fixed whatever um, issue. So in this case, everything works beautifully. Uh, there are no conflicts. There are no issues. It's kind of outside the scope of what we can talk about today about how to deal with merge and pull request conflicts when things don't merge automatically. Um, but that's an issue for another day. And so if everything works, if the, my development copy can just simply be moved to the main branch without any issues, there's no two lines of code that, you know, conflict, like one person changed line one, and then I tried to change line one, and they like don't match anymore. Um, we don't have to do anything with that because there aren't any of those. And so we can simply merge it. Um, and we see there's some options here. So some <laughs> basically force merging, either everything's green and great, so I don't even have to worry about squashing it, but merge, put all the development changes onto the main and then some like kind of brute force options of um, if there are conflicts, force taking one version of the other, um, which we I would caution against um, using. In general, if you're contributing to Big Slu, um, it's going to be you know my decision about clicking this button, so don't don't worry about it. So can I ask? Um... When you are doing your own updates and changes and you've got a fork, so you would have a fork on your local computers, I'm guessing. Right, right? but yes. Was, uh, yeah, a local, yeah, sorry. I keep saying fork when I mean branch. You have a branch on your local computer and you do, and you want to actually pull it into the main, you can just do it on your local computer um, and then commit everything up to GitHub, right? Push it to GitHub. Yes. So there's two options for, you know, working on your own repositories. And this is actually an active area that I'm trying to get better at. The first one is what I've done historically and is uh, not the ideal where I just work in the main and master branch all the time. <laughs> and then just whenever I push to GitHub, that's the new version for everyone to use. Um, these packages are kind of our first foray into curating software that other people can use. And so that's not a good idea because I might do something. <laughs> and you know just slap dash quick do something and not fully test it as well as i should uh so that i push these changes and then you know max goes to use the the latest version of Kima, and none of his old scripts work anymore and he's like what did you do um so the better way is to always if you even if you're owner of the repository to have a development branch always work in the development branch and then always go through this process even if you're the one who is doing the pull requests, even if you're the one approving them, it gives you those extra you know, minutes and steps to say, okay, I'm gonna create this pull request. Maybe I ask somebody else in the group, hey, can you review this? Can you pull the dev branch and make sure it doesn't break your code? Great, and then merge it, um, or I can merge it then. Um, so it is always better if you have a public repository that other people are using or a private one that you sh other people are using, to not mess with the main until you are really sure it's okay. So 
Um, if you're so when you're doing that and you're making changes in the development branch, say that you're you know you're closing up for the day, then do you change your head back to main before you you head out in case you need to use like somebody might need to be using those scripts that are in that Git repo, and you want to make sure that they're just using the most recent. So like let's say let's say somebody else is using those scripts, and there's a Git repo on you know a shared network. Um, and I want to update one of the scripts. So do I do a dev branch from that Git repo? And if somebody else is trying to call a script, will they then be calling from the dev repo and not from the main repo? So the default is always for it to be the main. So if somebody, like if somebody downloads this package using like, uh, in R, you know, DevTools install GitHub, it will only, unless you very specifically tell it, it will install from the main um, or master. So the main. Um, that's, not, that's not what I mean. So like we have, um, you know what, I think maybe I'll talk to you about it offline. I may not be explaining it right. Um, and it might be beyond, and you may have a, a solution for me, but it may be beyond what this uh, video is for. That's good. I mean, I think the only uh, additional thing I would say is that unless someone makes the active choice to move to the dev branch, then they're going to be in the main. And so it is one of those timing issues that if you're making like critical updates to something and you're not done with them, it's, you know, end of day Friday, like it might be, you push them, you put a message in the GitHub issue on that Friday saying like, Hey everyone, I'm not done. Nobody use this until I'm done. Cause it's broken or it's like something. Um, because you don't want to rush through pushing things to main so other people can use them if you're not ready. Um, but they do have the option of going to your development branch and saying, I know this hasn't been fully tested yet. Let me try and use it. And then maybe let you know if they have errors. Um, but they do have to make that active choice to go to another fork or branch. Okay. I, I'm going to send you a, a, just a message offline and you know yeah. try to explain what I'm, what I'm saying. Okay, thanks. So I'm just going to complete this um, merge, which we see it, it gives us, <laughs> it's not always the best message, um, number 12, but at least number 12 knows the way I can come back here. He said sometimes the defaults I would change, but we're just going to move forward. So three things have actually happened here. One, now the main version master is identical to dev because I've merged them. It has closed this pull request. And as we'll see when I move, it has also closed the issue because let's see, it's purple here, um, because I linked them. So those are the three things. Um, it also gives you the option if you're not going to be routinely contributing um, to a package, it's a good idea to delete your branch or fork when you're done um, because Otherwise, you're going to end up, particularly forks, you're going to end up with your GitHub, you know, account having 40 different forks from things you don't even work on anymore. And remember, since you've merged with the main, deleting your fork hasn't deleted and or branch hasn't deleted any of the history, hasn't deleted any of the commit messages. All of those have been merged with the main. So the revision history, the current versions of the scripts are all everything is saved. Um, so if you're not routinely going to be working in this, it basically, it'll say delete fork or branch, do that. I'm not going to since I routinely work on these. And like I said, I am trying to be better about working only in the development branch and not breaking um, everything. Point in case this commit uh, and this pull request I just did actually might might break other people's because it hasn't been fully tested yet uh, for the purposes of this tutorial, but that's a, on the to-do list. So kind of the overview recap of like what the steps you do. 
So if you want to contribute, and it's not just a big slew, um, it's to anyone, if you want to contribute to a package or to any other sort of public repository, the best way to do it is to create an issue or to work on an already there issue. There might be templates that help you create things. There might not. It might just be a blank where you need to have the conversation. Um, even if you're not ready to create your own issue or say, like edit the ones or work on them, work on the code, you know, this is a conversation. It also is very helpful to developers for you to come into this conversation and even just say like, I'm not gonna save this because I'm talking to myself. But like, if you also were trying to use Kimba and were like, man, I really wish there was a vignette, leaving a message saying, yes, I really wish there was a vignette is going to tell the developers, hey, when 10 people have said, oh yes, this would be helpful. Even if it's simply a like, yes, please do this, thumbs up. That helps them prioritize. This is a very simple repository. It only currently has five issues. You can go to other, particularly our packages, they'll have hundreds of open issues. And so, you know, you gotta, you gotta pick your battles. And if there's a bunch of people having a conversation about one battle, that's the one you're gonna work on. Um, so make an issue, add to an issue, contribute. And then if you feel like tackling one, um, again, look for that good first issue thing, um, create your branch or your fork. Um, that's my fork, the, the one. Go make your changes, test them as best you can. Um, don't feel like you have to super exhaustively text, test them. Um, the idea of a pull request is to also do additional tests there. So once you've made all your changes, create your pull request, link it to your issue, and then start the next conversation of adding it to the main repository, um, which sometimes the pull request back and forth is actually the longest part of the process um, as other people use your code for the first time and find all the errors that you didn't know were there. Um, the template for pull requests, we're going, I'm going to continue to work on and try to make really robust so that most of the test issues you will be able to do even before and then hopefully make this pull request process faster over time um, as things are pre-checked. And with that, so that's kind of the steps. Like I said there is the tutorial, which I will upload later, um, which goes through exactly the same sort of things, addressing, in this case, this GitHub issue here, which was a good first issue, which is why I did it, um, as well as some links and more information. And I will be posting this video to the YouTube link that is on here as well, once I have my regular internet back. Are there any other questions?